They sent us on an assault that night. He said, everybody in my unit was decimated. I, he said, I was literally in the, on the ground in a foxhole. I, he said, I was bawling. He said, I was crying, baby, because I knew that I was going to die. He's like, and then I remembered that I had this device that you gave me. He turned it on and he just curled up in a ball and all he did was just listen oh, wow. to God's word as bombs and bullets are exploding all around him. Hey everybody, welcome to a special edition of LED Live with the Meyer Brothers. We got Brock Meyer back in the show. Welcome, Brock. And uh, I think you guys are going to have a great, uh, a great time with today's show because it really hits at the heart of um, some very exciting things. I think we're witnessing the end of the world here as stuff is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, what people are in need of is hope. And uh, I, I think you're going to hear that out of this conversation today. Brock's got an awesome ministry. Um, he actually has been rallying around and going to some of these very dangerous places in the earth and spreading the gospel on the front line. So I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. But uh, you're going to want to hear the impact that this guy is having. It is absolutely beautiful. And I hope and pray that you are blessed by today's show. So Brock, tell us a little bit about uh, Gideon Rescue and what you've been up to. Uh, you've been in, in, in some pretty exciting parts of the earth. And where is that? Yeah, um, it's been an amazing journey for the past 13 years. God has really taught us some incredible lessons in the disaster zone. That's been our training ground um, and one thing we were taught early on was, you know, what is the most important uh, thing that somebody needs in a crisis moment? And so it, it all comes down exactly what you said. It's hope. You know, when humanity is unique in the sense that, you know, we are the only species on this earth that thrives off of hope. And we see that in society all around us. The world has fallen apart at an unprecedented rate as we speak. And what determines whether you thrive or whether you don't survive is your ability to hang on to hope. And so in these disaster zones, that's, that's really what we're going after first and foremost is giving people hope. And so, you know, one might ask, well, okay, so what kind of hope are you going after? And, and this is what I think is so amazing. You know, when you talk about Little Light Studios and the work that you guys are doing, you know, when you're in a crisis moment or in a disaster zone, you know, there, there really is no power in hoping in Disney. You know, there is no power in hoping in Marvel. Like there is no power in hoping in 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 any of the entertainment that's out there. All of a sudden the the love the playing field is leveled like never before because you recognize that these things that, that we have been sold on, cheap entertainment is what it is. Very cheap entertainment. Um, it, it doesn't fulfill the the soul's greatest need in crisis because you're not gonna look up and see Superman. You know, you're not gonna look up and see you know, your favorite character coming to rescue you, um, the only person that can actually help you in these crisis moments is God. And he's given us uh, a hope that is worth hanging on to, worth, worth giving everything for. And so our firm belief when we come to these disaster zones is, is people need the Lord, just like that song, that old yeah. school song, you know, people song. need the Lord like never before, right? And, and this, this is what people need. And so... Um, as we've made that our pursuit and our passion, like God has pulled out the stops and he has opened every door for us to be able to gain critical access to hearts and minds when they're hurting the most. Amen. Well, you know, as, as I've worked in ministry now for, um, pretty close to almost 15 years, I, I, I go to work and I sit at a nice computer in a controlled, uh, uh, temperatured room and, uh, you know, I'm sharing the gospel, uh, best that I can, uh, via the internet. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you're out there obviously wearing a bulletproof vest right now. So uh, show us a little bit of this bulletproof vest because I think this thing is really neat. Like you don't really think of ministry as like being literally on the front lines and rockets going over your head, stuff exploding, and you're sharing the gospel. And I love what you said about like in that situation, nobody's sitting there thinking about, man, I'm so glad I saw the latest movie or you know, I just I just want to go home and play video games. I mean, your whole world of what becomes important 
bubbles to the surface. And uh, I think it's rad that you have a team, Brock, that literally will strap on some bulletproof vests and go out into the fire and share the gospel. Well, I, you know, I can say, um, yeah, this is a bulletproof vest. Uh, I feel funny wearing it because I'm not, I'm not a soldier. I'm not trained as a soldier, but there's some key features about this vest that um, have, we, have, we have found to give us greater access to hearts and minds. Actually, I will disagree with you. I think you are a soldier. <laughs> Just not in the sense that you're carrying around a weapon taking life, you're actually saving life. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very true. Like, we're not about taking life, we're about preserving life because all life is valuable, you know, to God. And, you know, we know these verses, for God does not desire that any perish, but all come to everlasting life. Amen. So when you recognize that, then there are no political lines, there are no party lines, there is no left versus the right life becomes so sacred and so valuable that you're willing to, yeah, run into the fire to, so that others might live, you know, is the mantra. And so, I mean, this vest, it, it's just man's, you know, take on, on how to keep somebody safe in, in just an absolutely nightmarish situation. Um, and so, you know, yes, it's a plate carrier. It has, you know, we carry a, a, a steel plate or ceramic plate in here. And there's some extra medical supplies here. These are um, tourniquets, you know, got some darts for some airways. Um, and then pockets galore and Velcro, which actually really helps um, in a couple of ways. Number one, we can actually carry, one of my favorite things on this vest is actually this little uh, pouch here. It's actually made for... Um, discarding magazines. So when you're out there and you're like pop, 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 and you're ditching magazines, those magazines are expensive. So they make these little bags so you can stuff your magazines in there. But obviously we're not out there with AR-15s or M16s. And so it's perfect because we can fit our God pods or our books or our cards or whatever it is that we're fitting in there. So then when you're in the field, you can actually pull it out Give them a picture. That's a picture of Jesus coming again. Um, or you're handing them, you know, God's word in audio form now in this little audio player. And the soldiers absolutely love it. I absolutely love this idea because you're using an ammo bag for ammo, but it's just not the ammo that you actually think, right? You're blasting arrows of truth, if you would. And how are people responding to that? I mean, when you go, you've been to the Ukraine, you've been to Israel, like like you've seen some of these places where there is some pretty intense fighting. Like, are people like, get away from me. I've got, you know, things I got to do. Or how are they responding to you, handing them a piece of literature? Oh, man, it's, it's, it's you know, it's heartbreaking because... I think you get a glimpse into you know what Jesus what Jesus saw as he looked out and he saw the vast multitudes and he saw them as like sheep without a shepherd, and and this is really what the context of what you see when you walk into these environments is that these are people that are so precious, but they're so lost like they don't understand the greater picture of what's happening, you know just like the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and wickedness and darkness and high places like if people could only understand that the external for what we see is not the reality of what's actually happening there's a battle between good and evil the only currency in this world that matters is souls and that's what's being traded won or lost on a daily basis and so um, how do you reach people I mean that becomes the driving force in everything, I mean, that's what you guys are doing with Little Light. I mean, even though you may not be on the front lines, you are on the front lines because you are you are pumping out the truth, beaming it into somebody's cell phone and they're watching it and, and it's changing or shifting their perspective in hopefully in favor of eternity. Um, and I, I think in these crisis moments, it's that same principle, but it's just multiplied times 50, you know, or 100. Because now, um, you know, in some of these places that we've been, um, especially in, in, in Ukraine or in Israel. Um, you know, I remember in, in Israel, they were taking away all the soldiers' cell phones, you know? So here they are grabbing their cell phones and saying, check them in. They put them in a lockbox and the soldiers now have nothing when it comes to media, nothing. So you can't watch YouTube. You can't, you can't, you know, listen to your favorite rap music. You know, you can't, you know, spend all your hours on Facebook or looking at inappropriate videos or images of whatever. Um, but in that moment is an amazing moment where you can hand somebody then the right kind of media, right? So you give them the right kind of media and now that soldier going in for, let's say a, a, a six day journey into Gaza and he's now stuck in that Gaza Strip in some heavy fighting, he's gonna see horrible things. He, he may lose some of his guys next to him and, and now you've just armed him with 
God's word. And, and as he goes through those experiences, he now actually has an opportunity to choose life. Okay, so, so the whole Bible is loaded up onto this thing called a God pod. Yeah, yeah, the whole, the whole thing. These little in audio their players, language. mega voice. Yeah, yeah, you can put it in any language. This one's in Hebrew and in English because this one came from Israel. Um, and so we literally just loaded it up with the full Bible, the New Testament on there as well. Um, and, uh, and that was a big question, you know, when we were loading them, people said, well, you know, they're Jews. They don't want to listen to the new Testament. And right. you know what? The world is failing people. I mean, we know this revelation 14, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, right? right. So it doesn't matter what culture, what country, what religion you come from, you recognize the systems of man are not giving you what your soul really needs. And people know this, like this is not, right. this is not uh, foreign, you right. know, any place you go. And in Israel, there's no exception. They, they feel like the government has failed them. They're now in this crazy bid for trying to, you know, uh, keep their nation alive in the midst of all this hatred that's coming at them from every direction. And so they're, they, they see the great controversy. They know that, that, that something's not right. And so when you connect them with biblical truth, and you say, hey, guys, like we're here on a mission. We're here on a mission to give you hope. We're here on a mission to give you a message. Um, they are excited about it. They want to read about it. They want to hear about it. And so really, we have very little resistance when it comes to, um, you know, people turning us away and saying, no, thank you. You know, I remember I, I was even in Ukraine and, and you know, I gave it to a, a full on Satanist, like full on. He was like, I worship Satan. I don't want your Bible. And I just had my translator preach to him, like, hey, man, like, of all people, you need this more than anyone else. And as my translator told him that, like, it just, it, it, it broke down those barriers. He recognized that, wow, none of my Satanist friends are coming here to help me. But here's this crazy Christian that's here to give me a message of hope. Like, well, maybe I should actually listen to it. And he took it. And he was so grateful. So, um... I think when we're in a crisis moment, that's when we're most willing to listen. I mean, that's what they say. There's no atheists in foxholes. And, and that's, that's, that's incredible. Like if you were to say, what's the receptivity rate, you know, in a conflict or a crisis, a disaster zone, the receptivity rate is nearly 100%. You oh, get wow. a few sticks in the mud that are like, no, thank you. I'm going to deny God to the, to, the, to the very last breath. But most people, when they're in deep trouble, they'll fall on their knees and they'll say, God, where are you? Right. And that's literally the moment that God needs. Like, 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 I hope you guys are hearing this right now because this is so hitting at the heart of the gospel. This is how patient and loving God is, right? All he's got to do is plant that seed in there. And all you've got to do is give him that heart. Like, Lord, I've messed up or I didn't believe in you or whatever like this. If you're literally at that moment of on your deathbed and you go, God, I want you He's merciful. I mean, the thief on the cross proves that, right? And so I remember you telling me a story that you pulled up to a, a little guard shack way in the middle of like nowhere, uh, kind of on the road to going to Gaza, right? And you were starting to hand these things out. Uh, what was the reception like at, at this, just in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> you know, I, I think it becomes laughable almost at some point because, I mean, we carry U.S. passports, you know, and and in a lot of these missions, they happen so quickly. We don't have the proper time to contact all the authorities and get all the ducks yeah. in the road. Do you have a visa, sir? And get escorted and, <laughs> right. you know, all those details. And so we're really moving by faith. We're like, Lord, if you want us here, you're going to have to open the door because, because, because listen, it's not about us. Like we're, we're literally just flesh and bones underneath these, these little tactical vests, you know, and, 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 and oftentimes uh, it, we have to, we have to just go where God opens up those doors. And so we did end up in a situation where, um, you know, every time we'd come up to a checkpoint, they'd say, what are you doing here? And, and we would hand them, pull out the audio Bible that we had. We'd say, God sent us here for this. And we'd give it to them and they would take it and they'd be so excited. Like, oh man, this is so amazing. Thank you so much. And, and they're like, we can't believe you're here doing this. Like, it, and, and I think it's because it really catches them off guard. Like, like, you know, when you're in a, <laughs> who are you and why are you yeah, here? <laughs> when you're in a desperate bid for, for life and death, where you have bombs and rockets and missiles and, you know, bullets flying everywhere. You know, when somebody shows up and says, hey, you know, like now is the time to consider your eternal security, you know, your soul. Yeah. Then then people, yeah. they really take stock in that because they're already thinking about it, you know. And so really every checkpoint, this was our passport. Like we've stopped showing our passports in Ukraine, in Israel. We stopped, they, they stopped asking for our passports. If we were faithful when we rolled down the window and showed them this immediately as, the, as they asked us who we were and what we were doing, 
No problem. Go I mean, on, that's just we'll mind blowing. Where Christianity is the infidel, you are the enemy of the 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 Eastern idea, right? The Western world is like you know gone off the rocker to these people, and here they're being receptive to it. I think that's absolutely beautiful. But yeah, what a what a what a crazy situation! A bunch of Christians like literally roaming around in tactical gear, handing out versions of the Bible in their language, and I mean that is probably such a stark, like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that today. And then all of a sudden, I wish we could be flies on the wall because I'm sure if you could just hear the conversation between those people when they left, dude, was that an angel? Like, you know, they might start thinking, you know, did God directly send these people down? And and in a weird way, yes, it was, but but they don't know you from Adam, they don't, they, you know, and, and to see them actually accept it. And I think you even told me um, you had a couple of experiences where people were like, well, 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 can I have like three or four of them? Some of my buddies over here. And then can you go over to that guard shack down the road a little bit? I'm sure they'd want some too. And they're like directing you to their friends. Yeah. 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 And that's the awesome thing about it is that people recognize the truth. Like that's, that's, I, it says in the scriptures that God has planted eternity in everybody's heart. And so that is something that is inherent to our, our very being at our core. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what, what religious persuasion you are. Every single one of us knows that there is eternity. And if that means there's eternity, that means it's eternity to be won or, or lost. And so when, when you show up in these situations, people are excited and they want their friends to know. And that's the beauty of what the gospel is. It's the good news. When you say angel, angel simply just means messenger, right? So God desires his people to be messengers for him to give the good news. And that's why the commission, the gospel commission is to every tribe, every tongue, every kindred across the entire globe. There's not a single people group that won't be represented on that sea of glass when we get to heaven you know? So, so why not be in it to win it? And that's the question we had to ask ourselves, you know? Um, and this was, this is a tough question. You know, all, most of us within Gideon Rescue Company are actually family men. I have three kids, myself and a wife. And, uh, we had to really struggle with this as a family and, and work through this together because we had to ask the question, okay, Lord, like, you know, who, who is actually the best qualified to send into some of these dangerous areas? You know, who, who would be the best one to put forward? And, and it really has to be a, family a Christian who understands where they're going, right? Who, who understands the risk and is willing to take on that risk so that somebody else can live. Because if you and I, are, we're secure in our faith and our belief, like, hey, we know where we're headed. You know, our, our names are written in the book of life. We believe that by faith. Then there's a whole world out there that doesn't have that hope. It doesn't have that belief. So then, so then it becomes the Christian's duty to actually be in some of the most difficult places around the world so that people can receive hope. Like who else, who's else going to go? Like the scripture again says, you know, unless they hear by preaching, how are they going to know? And unless somebody goes as a preacher, then how are they going to ever have the opportunity? And, you know, paraphrase, and, and that's exactly the situation that we have is that, you know, there, there's, a, there's a huge component of this that really just is obedience and responding. I mean, it's so inspiring to me because when I read the stories in the Bible and I think about like some of those early apostles and the disciples and when they were willing to go around, I mean, some of them are family men, right? We know Peter had a wife and, uh, you know, they're willing to put themselves in some very dangerous situations, getting stoned and dying just to hopefully let me just win one more. Let me just, let me just get one more over here. And, you know, uh, I think, uh, part of our downfall is we're in such a comfortable environment where we're at. We like our little house, you know, we go to church and, you know, we get this like kind of comfortable existence going on when the rest of the world is in absolute shambles and turmoil. And it's like, you know, they're over there just blowing each other up, hatred, just fueling on either side of the fence. Right. And, and you guys don't even care about that. You're not there to see which side is the right side. Even if it was the enemy and you thought that was the enemy, that soul is still worthy of you putting a Bible in their hand and going, man, just make a choice for God. I mean, that to me is literally the heart of the gospel. I personally have not put myself in a position that I 
I, I think I might not come home from this, you know, like there's an op, there's a chance that I will not survive this or that I'm going into this, you know, uh, with, all right, God, you know, it's a, all, all, all of it's in yours. But that to me is inspiring that you guys are willing to do that. You're, you're, you're a bunch of paramedics and nurses and I mean, a different varieties and walks of life. I think you've, you've, you've brought, you know, real estate agents and <laughs> just random people on some of these trips. Right. Um, but I think it's beautiful. Uh, the, uh, a chance that I've had to talk with some of the people that have been over there with you and heard the stories from you, you're over there changing their lives, but really ultimately it's also changing your life in a big way. Coming back, your faith is going, you know, exponentially huge. You know, and, and honestly, really like we're, we're really nobody special. Like this is not like, you know, a big yeah, operation. Yeah, we're yeah. Not ex, operation. Yeah, yeah, we're we're not ex Navy SEALs. We don't have an unlimited budget. Like all we have is is, you know, the faith that that and I think our faith has really grown. You know, it's, this is not something that happened overnight. You know, 13 years we've been doing disaster response and God has been bringing us. We've never in fact we never even considered conflict zones. That was something that was really off the table for us in a big way because, you know, we were like, look, like we have no interest. We have no interest in war. We have no interest in being there. But I think as as our eyes were opened with the with the Ukraine conflict, you know, over a year ago when this started, um, we just recognized that the same principles are at play and even magnified. Because if you were to ask the question, who stands at the risk of a crisis eternity more than anybody else, it, it would have to be the civilian or soldier that's exposed to death and destruction on a daily basis. Some of these people, you know, like in Israel, they live with the threat of death every single day. That's crazy. Death from above, That's death crazy. from a bus stop. Like when we were there in Jerusalem, one of the very places we visited just to go, you know, see a couple sites in the city, like the day uh, after we were there, there was like some terrorist that just walked off and, and just gunned down everybody at the bus stop. And this is, this is the reality of where people, like this world is not getting any better. It's becoming much more violent, you know, everywhere we turn. And you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so, like, if there was ever a time now for some hope and some encouragement and to let people know their true identity as God sees them, then, then, then this is the need. And, and it requires still hands to be able to go and to minister to people in, in, in that way. Um, and so it, it's, it's uh, I think the, the power really that we've learned as we've gone through this is just trusting the promises that are in God's word. You know, there's some incredible promises in God's word, you know, like incredible promise. Like this is where the word comes alive. You know, it's living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's better than any weapon that this world could muster or manufacture. God's word could, could defeat anything, right? And so if we believe that by faith, then it, it's, not a, it's not a presumptuous move. It's, it's a move of bold faith to look at the situation just like David did or just like any other mighty men who were in the Bible who said, you know what? The situation is not right. There are people that, uh, you know, that are at risk here. And so therefore it requires action for me to do something, for me to step forward, to me to say, Lord, here I am, send me. And, and as you put your confidence in God's word, then the promises become true. Like God says, I'll, I will send out my word and it's gonna accomplish the thing that I've sent it to do. It will not return to me void. And, and so when you, when you see those promises in action, it, it's, it's faith building. I mean, you're like, whoa, this is so incredible. God walks you through the Bible. So tell me about the experience that you had speaking about this exact thing right here. You don't know if you are going to even make it through the night. And you got an opportunity to um, hand some God pods to a team of, uh, I think it was Navy SEALs-ish type people. And then um, they took them away and you heard something tragic happened. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was in Israel. Um, I. You know, um, it, it happens on all sides, you know, where we've been. Um, but I'll highlight a couple, one from Israel, one from Ukraine. Um, we, we had a group of, of guys that were a part of a special elite unit within Israel. And um, they were right on the border with Gaza. And so all these soldiers are going in. You know, they're coming out, they're going in. And they're exposed to really, you know, just horrible things. You know, like war is so horrible. And, and especially modern warfare today is so cowardly. You know, it's at least back in the day, you had to look your enemy in the eye, you know, as you thrust him through with your sword. But I mean, Which today, I think that would be terribly yeah, difficult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah know, it would like, still be, it'd still be horrible, yeah. right? But I mean, at least you, you know, like, hey, we are going to now grapple, you know, person to person. 
and and it, that requires a whole level of honor and, and bravery that is just not present in modern warfare today um, in many ways. It's easy to press a button and hurl a explosive at somebody. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we're so disconnected from, you know, like I, even launching an RPG or a rocket, like you have no idea like where that's going, what level of destruction some cause. You never see that on the other end. You just are the one that initiates it. It's like so, playing a video game. Yeah, and, and so here we met this whole, and that's really what it is. Like when you want to talk about video games, um, man, it, it's so evil. Like, you know, all this modern warfare, Call of Duty, these video games that are so actively, you know, at our forefront of our minds Just today is you. the reality of what's being built on the ground around the world is that we're now stepping into not just the the gaming theater, it's now the reality of actually, you know, the practice and the art of war. Um, and it's, it's just, it's so cowardly. I mean, there's so many things about it that are just absolutely evil, but, um, we met this unit going into Gaza and, um, these guys were, I think an ordnance artillery unit and they were just lobbing like grenades and, you know, missiles and things all over the wall into Gaza. We were literally on the wall between Israel and Gaza. And, um, I think we had been, uh, they had an opportunity to deliver some food. So we were there like delivering them some food. But of course we saw it as like, hey, this is not just an opportunity to deliver yeah, food. Let's this give is an some opportunity spiritual food. to actually give these guys like the gospel, right? So here we re we got 20 minutes. So what are you going to tell somebody in 20 minutes? Like it's just, it, it's it's hard, you know? Like, yeah. and, and so we run up and we try to connect with them and wisely. like, hey, and they, you know, they want to know who we are and where we're from. And, you know, do we have families? And like, so, you know, in this friendly exchange of getting to know these guys, um, you know, they even had a tourniquet. They wanted to see how fast an American could put on a tourniquet versus, you know, uh, Israeli. And so we had this little contest putting on these tourniquets. So it just, it was great. Like God gave us the perfect entrance, the perfect opportunity to gain that trust quickly. And then I remember distinctly one of the guys, he looked at me and he, I was wearing this vest and he points at this patch and he says, he says, what is that on your vest? And I was just like, oh, this is perfect, right? And I actually was filming. This actually is a, a case for my phone. So my phone was in here and it was totally rolling the entire time. Beautiful. And uh, I, just, I just told him, I said, hey man, I said, we are here on a special forces mission, but not in the way that you think. This is not about flesh and blood. This is not about Palestinians versus Israelis. I said, we're here to deliver you a message of hope. And that's what's on this audio player that we're giving to each one of you guys. Like you guys got to go back. You got to listen to it. Please Beautiful. promise me, listen to what you're, you know, what's on here. Cause it's going to explain it in depth and detail. And it's going to be amazing. And then I said, as far as this patch, I said, we've got three bars here. The three bars represent three messages that come from Revelation 14, because there's three angels that are giving us three warnings at the very final close of earth's history. And it's very simple. Number one, remember your identity. Who has created you? right? Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. We're living in a time of judgment. You're seeing the failure of the systems around us. And that ties right into the second message. Babylon has fallen. You're, you're going to recognize that the government here in Israel is going to fail you. You're going to recognize that Hamas and terrorist groups are going to fail you. You're going to recognize that the United States and, and everybody else that is around the world is going to fail you because Babylon is fallen and there's no fixing it. We're not going to save this ship from going down. It's going down hardcore. So therefore, the last message, which is super important, is don't receive the mark of that system. Like get in the lifeboat and the only safety that, that, that we have to get in that boat is God's word, right? So like break it down to them real simply and man they were just yeah. they were like in awe they yeah, were they it. were just like this is amazing like yeah please tell we want to know more well sadly we only have 20 minutes with them and right now the guy's in the, in the jeep yeah. yelling at us he's like come on time to go like let's go and it's like oh you know just breaks your heart because you want to stay with these guys for like the next yeah. six yeah, hours let's have a bible, bible study. <laughs> study and like just yeah, sh share the truth with these guys right uh, but, you know, you have what you have, and, and that's what God granted us in that moment. And uh, sadly, I think a couple days later, we learned that the eight guys from that unit, the very guys that we were visiting and interacting with, eight of those guys lost their lives in, a, in a, an assault or an attack or something that happened. And so, wow. so when you see how small that window is, right, the devil's desire is to destroy people for eternity. And he doesn't care how he does yeah. it. He doesn't care if it's the long road through pornography and destroying all of your relationships or 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 if it's or if it's through the 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 short road of of a drug deal gone bad. I work as a paramedic on an ambulance and, and man it kills me. This, the other day I, I worked this this guy that uh, a young guy, he's my age, you know, 30 33 years old. I'm a little older than that, but 33 years old and uh, he went to just go buy some weed in in the in the park and the guys instead of selling him the weed, they saw he had a wad of cash and they tried to rob him. He said, "No, I'm not giving up my money." They shot him point blank in the chest. 
And it was just like, wow, that's it. Over right? a $20 I mean, like, bag of weed. Like for, for one small decision, your life has now been altered forever. Forever. So um, he actually did survive. We ended up getting him on a helicopter and, and getting him down to a trauma center, but I think he's paralyzed from the waist down as a result, which is just which is just another way that the devil wants to just, yeah. ugh, just yeah. make sure that make your you soul miserable. is destroyed forever, right? Like unless unless you have hope, right? That's that's the thing. Unless you have hope in a God who can solve even the worst of situations. Because the Bible says all things work together for good to those that love God and called according to his purpose. So unless you have that hope, that's the only thing that's going to carry you through. And so that's what motivates us. Like, man, these soldiers, they're going to see the same kind of stuff, man. Like one of their buddies is going to get shot. He may die. He may survive with horrible deficits and wounds for the rest of his days. You know, and you, th- you um, but you know he's gonna be recalled to that conversation, and it maybe was just one conversation that you had with him, one seed, one thing, and he's gonna be sitting there, laid up in the hospital, going, "Wait, I got this like God pod thing in my pocket. Like, what is this? Exactly. Can't move. Exactly. Let's just listen to it." And man, that guy's gonna be one to the kingdom. You know, something as simple as that. When when we were when we were in Ukraine, when we were in Ukraine. Uh, Dylan tells this story. He was another guy that was with me, another buddy of mine that, that's uh, been involved with this. There's only been about three of us. Like when I say small operation, there's like three, four of us that have been involved in this kind of stuff. Like we're not, we're not some huge team. It's a drop in the bucket. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. And uh, we, Dylan handed one of these devices to a Ukrainian guy that was real hesitant to take it. He's like, I don't know, man. And so, but eventually he took it. Like three or four days later, this same guy tracked us down. He found us because we kind of circled on the same area, hit the same spots. And so he found us. He saw us and came running up to us. He said, I have to tell you, the day that you gave that to me, they sent us on an assault that night. He said, everybody in my unit was decimated. I, he said, I was literally in the, on the ground in a foxhole. I, he said, I was bawling. He said, I was crying like a baby because I knew that I was going to die. He's like, and then I remembered that I had this device that you gave me. And he said he pulled it out. He pulled it out of his jacket, out of his flak jacket. He turned it on and he just curled up in a ball. And all he did was just listen oh, wow. to God's word as bombs and bullets are exploding all around him. And, and he said, he said, I know that I was spared that night because of this that you gave me. He said, what is this? And it was like, oh man, this is the greatest, this is the greatest, you know, message in the world. And he was like, can I have more for oh, my wow. friends, please? Oh, wow. Like, oh, how wow. many can you give me to, to yeah. hand out to my friends? He's like, there are yeah. other men in my unit that need to have this device. And it's like, man, you know, like there, there is power in the word. Like, like, like this is such a crazy day and age that we live in. Like, like you think, and you've heard of these stories of people that had a Bible in their chest and somebody shot them and the Bible stopped the bullet. I mean, here's an example of digital words literally running through a computer chip on a little tiny thing that saved somebody's life. I mean, that's, that's God's word. Now, that's now word. I, I haven't been shot yet, but I will tell you this. When, when, we, went into, when we went into Israel this last time, this is actually a, a book called Desire of Ages, and it's in Arabic. Beautiful. Um, and it's really, it's just a beautiful book. It's Desire of Ages, of by the way, is about the, the life of Jesus. And beautiful yeah. book, beautiful book if you haven't read that Amazing. book. Amazing. Amazing. And we had a challenge because um, I, I, we didn't have time. We, we had one set of plates for my buddy. I, I, didn't, I didn't have time um, to grab. We, we didn't have another set of plates. And most of the time when we go to Ukraine, we just pick them up when we're in Ukraine because there's plates like everywhere. You can go to military surplus stores and everything. And um, in Israel, we kind of thought, well, maybe we'll find some other plates there too. So my vest didn't have any plates. And so um, going in there, actually, what I ended up doing was I ended up stuffing the Desire of Ages up inside my plate carrier. Um, and, and that's all I had was just a book, you know, um, between me and my chest, you know, but, but, and, and it's not a, it's just, it's just another illustration of like, how important do we really value, you know, the gospel and, and these, these resources that point people to Jesus, you know, is it, is it what they need? Is it what could give you that physical protection? Um, I believe so. I mean, we see, we see stories of this all the time where it's like, man, if I just had one more resource, you know, to hand somebody. Um, it's like that Schindler's List movie, you know? It's like you get to the end of it and, and you don't want to be sitting there with that gold ring on your finger and saying, Lord, I, I could have I reached one more person with this ring, you know? Yep, I know. I think about that all the time and I go, at some point, we're going to have to like release all of the little castle stuff that we're building up here in this kingdom. And, and if it can be used for the gospel or used to spread the message, I mean, nobody's going to get to heaven and be like, man, I'm so glad I got three houses and you know, I got a BMW sitting in my driveway. No one's going to say that. 
You're going to talk about the people that you should have gone and talked to, the, 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 the little experiences that you had right here, that you could have changed someone's life. You could have handed something to them that would have been revolutionary to them, and they walk away from you, and per perhaps that was their last moment. And so, um, you know, I think, I think it is absolutely beautiful, and, and to hear you know, your reaction in the face of death, how you actually respond to those things. I know you have a video clip that I want you to play um, that is absolutely a beautiful illustration of somebody that, you know, um, caught the vision of what your ministry is all about. And um, for those of you that don't know, I, I, I want to, you know, I want to inspire you to look Gideon Rescue up. We will put the link in the description below. But but take a time to to um, see some of the things that these guys have put out. They've they've got a YouTube channel that they're putting some content out with some of the stories that that have been happening. They're working on a documentary right now, which is a huge huge like you know undertaking. I mean they 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 had a filmer um, that just went with them to Israel and, and and tell us a little bit about that, Brock, because I think this is a really interesting thing that God is also doing, trying to get these stories out to help inspire people. Um, how did you get a filmer to go with you into this situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, you know, I've been I've been uh, bugging you for a long time, like, man, we got to we got to film this, we got to capture this, and and uh, and you know how, you know, you guys know it a little bit how tedious it is to like film and cut and edit and put together, and 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 none of us are filmers or photographers or editors, and so. We're always at the short end of the stick, literally just filming with our iPhones what we can capture. And the stories are so compelling and so inspiring to us that we feel it's our duty and obligation to share these stories with people. And so uh, we've had a couple of filming opportunities that have come our way, not not ones that we've actually sought for, which is the way we want it. Like, you know, we, we want God's timing to be perfect in this. And we really want it done in a way that that takes all the credit off of our table. You know, like we don't want anybody to look at us and say, wow, this is because Gideon Rescue and they're just, you know, they're armed to teeth. They're look at their cool vests or look at their, yeah. you know, amazing training. It puts training the or lens on has, the dude, right dude, person. Has, it has nothing to do with that. If you guys could literally see how this operation is run by human standpoints, you know, people would laugh. Um, but... Uh, you know, what we found is that, you know, God is faithful. And um, and as we've been faithful to that message, he has then put us in position so that we can tell the story that gives him all the credit and all the glory. And um, we had Daniel Hazel, who's with Adventist World Radio. He actually came with us to Ukraine uh, back in September this last year. And he had an amazing just, you know, like experience with the team filming, documenting, uh, capturing and it was it was almost it was so weird it was almost as if God was directing and, and I believe he was like God was directing this this whole story as it was unfolding because it really like there was no pre-thought or work that we had put into it. we weren't writing scripts or writing like well we need to capture this piece and that keep it literally just as it unfolded God just got Daniel some amazing footage and amazing stories and it was just like whoa I mean this is gonna be incredible so Daniel's working on that right now the release date is supposed to be early this year. Um, at some point, he's going to screen it and let it and let it uh, be released. And it's and it's also not just something that's going to be in the Christian realm. He really actually wants to release it in the secular world too, because that's where people are really struggling for hope. Is they they don't they don't see the value of what God has to offer. And so Daniel really wants to be able to reach even the, that secular audience. So he's going to try to see if he can enter it into some film festivals and whatever. So we'll see what, how where God takes that. Um, and then the next one in Israel, yeah, we did have a, a guy that joined us. Um, his name is Itamar and, uh, amazing guy, 40 year veteran, you know, photography film. And, uh, he's secular. He's not a, he's not a Christian. He's not a real religious guy to begin with. And so it was a really interesting pair up. We didn't seek him out either. This was kind of a, a friend of a friend that was like, this is so amazing. Like, can I make some contacts? And we said, well, if God puts it together, sure. Who are we to say no? Um, and so, uh, he came with us and what was so amazing about that is that, uh, he really was able to see the hand of God, like never before. I remember when we were at a loss of where to go next and here we are in the middle of the battle zone and, you know, things are happening and we can't sit there very long cause you know, we're sitting ducks and, and it's, it's kind of a nerve wracking situation. And, and so Dylan and I were talking about for like, what do we do? Okay. Where do we go? And like, and, and in that moment, it's in the back seat with the camera. He says, he says, uh, well, you guys should do what you normally do, which you should pray and ask him. 
and uh, it seems like he keeps opening doors and guiding your footsteps where you need to be. So pray awesome. about it. And it was like, well, yeah, of course. Like yeah. good, good suggestion. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> we're gonna so go with that plan. It made, uh, yeah, it made, it made, it made a big impact on him. And he saw, I think he saw really the heart of what the gospel is at its core in willing to risk oneself to give somebody a message of hope. And he was able to document that whole thing. Um, and so we're hoping to be able to put some of those those clips and that story together in a meaningful way that's going to tell that story, you know, of, of the journey in Israel. Um, but it's not just Israel. This story is incomplete um, because, um, you know, it's one thing to go to Ukraine where you're like, well, yeah, sure, you know, Ukrainians love Americans and go to Israel. Yeah, sure. You know, you, Israelis love Americans. It's a whole nother thing to consider fields like uh, Gaza, you know, inside Gaza, you know, or or to consider fields like Russia, you know, like how do we get to Russia? But 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 that's the thing is that the gospel is no less, um, you know, important for these places as well because God loves the Russians as much as He loves the Ukrainians. And I guarantee you, from what I I'm just going to put this out here as a disclaimer, from what we've seen on the ground is not what they're feeding you in the news. You are not getting the full picture. There is a lot of manipulation that's happening here. And, and it's because there are political agendas that are huge, that are moving this world into the very place where prophecy said we would be. And that is where no man may buy or sell, save he received the mark of that system. And unless you go with that system, you will be cut out of that system in a significant way in order to try to bring you to your knees to capitulate. But that, but, but God has a promise. God has, God has, you know, a thousand ways to provide which we know nothing of. He can hide you beside the brook Cherith like he did for Elijah. You know, uh, he feed can cover you food you off of Jezebel's feathers. table. Yeah, he can feed you. I mean, like this is, and, and on that note, I have, to, I, have to, I have to tell you this story because this is so incredible to give our, you know, viewers, you know, some hope and encouragement because we, li- we live in a scary day and age, you know, like with the technology that's happening around us right now. And, you know, they're listening to every phone call. They're, they're recording all of your information. You know, Facebook is one of the greatest data collectors on, on people. Hitler would just be so excited if he had right. Facebook available right. from the 1940s. And, um, and, yet, and yet, you know what? God's word is bigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God's right. word yeah. Yeah. is stronger. Amen. And, and I remember we, we, we were in um, Israel and uh, we came up to a check, very heavily fortified checkpoint. And, uh, and they said, where do you want to go? And we said, we're trying to go to the south, to um, Kadesh Barnea, which is like a little kibbutz in the south, about right on the Egypt border. And we were kind of thinking if we could get to the Egypt border with Israel, maybe we could cross over into Egypt. And then from Egypt, we'd go into Gaza because mm. the Gaza border is shared with, with Egypt. And so we were just trying different options. Of, Lord, how, how do we you know, reach people on all sides of this? And so... Um, they said, well, okay. And they said, what, are you, what is your mission? What are you doing here? Showed them, showed them the God pods, pulled out our little devices and said, we're here because God given us a special mission to give you one of these things. And, um, and they said, yeah, sure, go through. That's awesome. So they opened the gate. They, they let us through. And pretty soon we found out we're on this road. And it was between Egypt and between Israel. And it was 30 kilometers, which is quite a distance, like driving. Um, 30 kilometers on this road and we were the only ones on this border road. Yeah, like, that's a little I mean, eerie. Like this high security border road. We're passing these huge tall towers that have like high res cameras and like, you know, like that's how they watch the borders with all these cameras and stuff. And the border fence is like, you know, 60 feet high, you oh, know, wow. razor yeah, wire, go giant, you know, giant wall. Like nobody's coming across that. And, uh, and as we're driving, you know, Itamar, he sees this whole convoy of trucks on the other side, our cameraman, he's like, stop the car. So I stopped the car and he's like, all right, back the car up. So we back the car up. He's like, all right, turn to the left. All right. So we turn to the left, get a better angle, turn to the right, turn to the right, get a better angle. And pretty soon, you know, Dylan and I were a little nervous, like, man, you know, Itamar, we got to keep going. Like we're on this like board where they're watching us with these cameras, you know, like if we stay here and look like we're monkeying around on the wall, like, you know, they may just like decide to take us out. Um, so so uh, so we kept going, and when we got to Kadesh Barnea, the the guards there at that side they were so surprised they were like, they didn't even they weren't even guarding our road because nobody comes down that road, and so we had to like knock on the gate and the guard shack be like, hey, can we get the gate open? You know, so we go through, and um, they had to call their superiors. It was a big deal. Like yeah. apparently we weren't supposed to be on that road. Like, who are you? This whole, How did you get here? This, this, this whole 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 ordeal. They finally let us go, and we went into Kadesh Barnea, and Ismar had a friend there who was like head of security of that particular little settlement of that kibbutz. 
And um, his friend, he asked us, he said, where did you guys come from? And we said we came from the north. He's like, well, what route did you take? And because all the routes are, are blocked and like it, it's a mess. Like traveling is, is you know, long, you got to take a lot of long routes everywhere. And uh, we said, well, we came down this one particular border road. And he just looked at us and he said, no, you didn't. And we said, yeah, we did. And he said, no, you didn't. He's like, I'm an Israeli. He's like, and I'm head of security. He's like, they won't even let me on that road. He's like, there's no way you came down the road. I said, well, <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know what to tell you, but Itamar has footage of it. You know, like we, we were on this road, you know? And so he was, he was blown away, but it just gave greater weight when we told him why we were here. When we gave him the, the God pod, when we gave him the message of why we were here, he was just, uh, he was in, he was amazed. And he said, well, I want you to, he said, I want you to meet this unit of, of all female soldiers that are up on the hill and their responsibility is border security. He's like, I need you, to, you guys have an amazing story and what you're doing. I said, I want you to meet. So we did, we went up to the hill, met these female fighters and um, it, it's the only female unit in all of Israel. 727 is their unit. And, um, and so we just interacted with these girls. They were very curious as to who we were and what we were doing. We told them what we're there for and had just an amazing, it was, it was that first night was the first night of Hanukkah. So we ended up lighting like the first candle of Hanukkah. We, we taught them the song, This Little Light of Mine, because uh, they, 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 you know, that's what you do when you do Hanukkah is you sing songs. And, yeah. and so yeah. they were oh, like, well, do you have a song? That's like, a good song for them. <laughs> and we were like, ah, oh, yeah, this little light of mine. You know? <laughs> it was like, it was perfect. And, and they were like, what song is that? And I was like, well, it's a song we teach our kids, you know, and it's, it's amazing, you know. And, yeah. Um, and we didn't hold back. Like we told these, we told these girls, we told these girls where this world's headed. We told them exactly what's about to happen, you know, and that's the power, that's the power of the gift of prophecy. God has given us the gift of prophecy to understand what's going to happen next. And with assurance, you can know what are the next major events. Maybe not all the details in between, but you can know what's about to happen. And, and this, this is the power of God's word. And so as we deliver that to them, they were just in awe. I mean, as Israeli girls, most of them very secular. One of them, she was, she was full on in, a, in a, um, you know, an LGBTQT lifestyle. And she had questions for us. And so, it, and it just, the whole thing opened up in just this incredible evening where we shared with them. And right as we're about to depart, Dylan, you know, he, he looks, they have this, you know, video screen where they're watching the, the border with these high res cameras. And the whole time we were there, they had this huge drone. I mean, huge drone. I think it was probably like seven feet in diameter. The thing was ginormous. And, and the thing was constantly up in the air. The only time they brought it down was to change the battery pack out. And then it was back up in the air. And they were just patrolling the whole time we were there. We were talking to a couple of them, but, but most of them had their eyes fixed and their attention fixed on watching the border. They're zooming in on a little lady on the other side that's picking up sticks. And, uh, and so Dylan, he just asked him, he said, hey, he said, we came down this road, you know, a couple hours ago in our little Avis rental car. You know, like what uh, would you guys see? And they were like, no, you didn't. You didn't come down that road. Oh, wow. Like, we, we did. Oh, yeah. Wow. And they were like, no, you didn't. They said, we've been watching this border the whole time. If you would have come down the road, we would have seen you. We'd have known. We would have been tracking you. Oh, they wow. said, nobody's even allowed on this oh, wow. road. They said, the army's not even allowed on this road unless they have special permission and air support and like a, a, an escort and all these things. There's no way that you came down this road in a rental car and you just drove down this border road and we didn't see you because we've been watching this. And we believed and we're like, look, you guys are diligent in your job. We're not trying to say that you're, you're, you're slacking or you're sleeping on the job, right? Like, I know you guys are diligent yeah. what you're doing. You guys are the best, right? That's how you've been trained. Yeah. But at the same time, we told them, listen, this is the power yeah. of that, God. That's when you pull out the God pod and you show them the invisible button on the front and you say, you know, look, this is, has an incognito mode right here that if you actually turn it on and listen to it, people will not see you. <laughs> yeah, and, and so that's that's the but that's the point is that can God hide us when he needs to? And the answer is yes. Even the most powerful security state in the Western world, Israel has has security like you would yeah. not believe, man. Scary, scary stuff on how they're tracking and watching people. And and yet Psalms 91 says that if we take shelter under the shadow of the Almighty, Almighty if we hide mm -hmm. under his wings we will be covered, That's right, right. yeah, and abiding that's, in that's the, the shadow power of the God's Almighty. Word. So, man, who wouldn't want that promise? In this scary day, in, day and age in which we live, who does not want that kind of protection for their family, for their friends, for their loved ones, for themselves? Like, like Lord, hide me in your pavilion. You know, if I need to be hidden, cover me when I need to be covered. Be my shield, be my buckler, be my tower of defense. Like, this is the power of God's word and it's living, it's quick. Like, you don't, you don't need a gun in your hands. 
You need the word of God in your hands, in your heart, in your mind. Like this is, this is the need for today. That's right. Ah, Brock, those are beautiful stories. And I am looking forward to seeing this documentary that you guys are working on. Um, I can't wait for this thing to be out. But you guys know it takes resources to make these kind of things. So if you want to help support Brock's mission, which is literally putting the Bible in the hands of people on the front lines, please look his ministry up, check him out, and then pay attention to uh, Gideon Gideon Rescue when uh, they release the documentary. Um, um, You will want to see some of these stories because they are truly amazing. Um, Brock, as you uh, uh, sign off here, though, set up the uh, the video you, you want to show with uh, a, a woman that came and started working with your ministry, and she really caught the vision of your ministry. Um, tell us a little bit about her. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you don't realize the impact that you have on people. Um, and uh, we were doing a swift water rescue training up in Oklahoma City. And sometimes even our trainings, we're kind of wondering like, oh, Lord, like, is this really, maybe we just need to be training people how to hand out a piece of literature or a Bible, you know, because that's really like the greatest need. So what is, what is swift water really going to gain us here in the end? But, you know, in that training, we had this mom who came and she was so excited about it. She was just like on fire for her, her little kid. He was eight years old and Banner. Um, and we had some, we had some real amazing times with this. This kid was like, he was, he was that kid that you'd throw him in the water and he wouldn't get out. Like he, he just wanted to do it again and again and again until he was at the point of like total exhaustion. We had to pluck him out of the water and sit him on the bank and say, hey man, you need, you need a breather. Like you know, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna make it next round if you don't take a break. You know, he was so into it, so excited about the skills that he was learning. Um, you know, his life jacket was two sizes too big and his helmet was falling over his face, you know, but he just, he was having the blast of his life. And his mom had driven there like three plus hours to come and train with us. And she did it like two or three times that we did trainings in the summer this couple, uh, it was a year ago. I think it was about a year ago. And uh, we didn't see her or hear from her for about a year. And we kind of wondered like, hey, you know, what happened? You know, some, and sometimes it happens. Like we get people that are interested in what we do and they kind of come in and come out and we don't see them for a while. <clears throat> and... Um, she came back that next summer and she said, can I just tell you guys like what God's been doing in my life? And we we're like, well, yeah, of course. And she had this incredible testimony, this incredible story of, of just like tragedy. Like that's what had kept her from us knowing what was going on in her life. And uh, it, she was going through this incredible struggle and we had no idea. And she didn't even reach out to us, not even, not even a request for prayer. And so, um, but but she just told us in the aftermath of this, she was like, that, that time that I had with you guys gave me courage and gave me the setup that I needed to face that tragedy because of the mindset that you guys were talking about when you go into these disasters, when you go into these places, and your number one focus is giving people hope. And it was just like, whoa. And so that, that's, uh, that's the story, really. I mean, I don't want to ruin it for... People that listen to it, but it's just, it was so inspiring to see somebody who'd, who'd just really captured that and encapsulated that in a very personal situation in their life that made all the difference in the world. And if, and if that's all we can do is just inspire people with that, then game over. I mean, that's, we're, we're satisfied. Like, Amen. let's do it. Amen. All right. We're going to play that video right now. You will be blessed by watching this video. I guarantee it. I was able to join Gideon Rescue. My son and I were able to join Gideon Rescue for a whitewater training event in Oklahoma City a couple of times, several times. And uh, the first worship that they had um, before the event began, um, they spoke about that their worship was about being bold for God. And so when I heard that worship, it just made me cry because um, I just felt confirmation that this was where God was leading me to um, develop boldness for Him and that being in the company of Gideon Rescue was the right place for me to be. So um, my son and I spent a couple of um, weekends doing the swift water training. And while it gave us skills um, to help in a flood situation or something like that, It also just gave me time to talk with um, Brock and Greg and Corey and Wendy and 
It gave me time to absorb their philosophy um, towards uh, sharing the gospel. You can tell that these people believe that the Lord is coming so soon, there's no excuse to not share. And if a man is drowning, you're going to do everything to go and, and save that man. And they approach um, sharing the Word of God with people that don't know Jesus. These are drowning people and, and we need to do everything we can, make ourselves look like fools if necessary, um, to get that Word in front of them, to, to give them the name of Jesus. And so. The philosophy of Gideon Rescue Company is such that the Lord opens doors in the worst of situations. And even though people think that this is all about me losing my house and me losing my car and me losing, you know, our town is destroyed or whatever, and then Gideon Rescue comes in and provides whatever care they can that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is the prayer that these people have with those who have lost everything. It's about um, the literature that they're able to share with them. And it's about taking that golden opportunity to put the name of Jesus before people who are now in a situation where they will accept it like never before. And that meant everything to me. That changed the way that I looked at life. And so I started looking at life as what, what opportunity lies before me and how can I boldly go forward and share God with somebody. When the radiologist looked at the scans and he said this is suspicious for cancer i was shocked um, to say the least and i didn't really know what to think but i left the clinic that day walked out to my car i was by myself because i wasn't expecting to get bad news that day and um, i had my bible in the car and so i just sat in my car in the parking lot and I opened up my Bible and I read a few verses. I turned on my um, music. I listened to a couple of um, songs. And then I just prayed that God would do with this cancer what He wants to do. Um, it was the most surreal and strange feeling of peace that I've experienced. But I was thinking about Job and how he had just lost everything and he had just lost his children and his first act was to worship God. And I wanted that to go down on my record in heaven. I just got the worst news that I've ever gotten, but I wanted worship to be my first act. And so I gave the cancer to God and I asked him to do something with it because um, I have a family, I have four children and I did not know how my story was gonna end. So I took the philosophy of Gideon Rescue into my cancer clinic and um, whenever I would go, I would bring literature with me and I would put it in a little baggie with chocolates and whenever I would see somebody that would look a little sad, um, I would pray about who to give this literature to. And I had surgery to remove uh, the tumor and I was on the surgery table just about to go under and I, I told um, the surgeon and the people there, um, thank you for, for how you're about to save my life and um, I want to pray with you. And so I was able to pray with them. And then after my surgery, I gave my surgeon uh, a gift, which to me is the greatest gift that I can possibly give, which is a copy of the book Desire of Ages. Um, it talks all about the life of Jesus and 
it has changed my life and brought me closer um, to the Lord. And I wanted to share that with her. So um, a few weeks later, my surgeon called me and she said, thank you so much for giving me that book. It's on my night table right now and I've already started reading it. And so I was just so grateful and I thought, Lord, if you saw fit that I should have cancer so that I could give this book, this beautiful book that talks about you to this person, and that's the only reason, that's okay with me. And I'm just really grateful that you would use me to do that. Um, I got chicken pox. Uh, I, I went through chemo and my white blood cells were very low and um, my son was exposed to chicken pox at school. And so I got it from him and it was very, very bad. I had to go to the hospital for eight days because they thought that it might go into my brain and be a bad situation. Um, and while I was there in the hospital, uh, I was able to pray with a nurse there and I told her, you know, if I got chicken pox and I had to come to this hospital just to get to know you and have this prayer um, and talk to you about your boyfriend that is not treating you right um, and encouraging you to talk to Jesus about it, then that's okay with me. And um, I consider that a huge privilege. And just last month I finished my uh, 20 weeks of chemo and I gave my nurses, I had four nurses, I gave them all a copy of the book Steps to Christ. And so over each and every one of those pieces of literature, I would pray that the Holy Spirit would go with that book, go with that pamphlet, and would call that person to, to be attracted to it, to read it, to open it up. And I also wrote inside of it telling them thank you for being such a great nurse and hope that they don't throw it away simply because it was written in. Um, because the message of life is in that book. The Desire of Ages is an incredible book and it leads people to the Bible, which is everything. So I, I stand here today incredibly grateful to have gotten to know a group of people that take so seriously that we are living in the very last days and that every stop needs to be pulled in order to get people to know who Jesus is. And it has helped me through my own personal crisis. It has helped me approach it with gratefulness and humility and just um, such gratitude to God that He would, honestly, this is honestly how I feel, and I know it sounds weird, but I'm just grateful that He would trust me with this and let me be able to talk to other cancer patients, a group of people I never thought I would have access to. And I don't know how I would have approached it if I hadn't met Gideon Rescue. Um, they're very, very special to me and to my son. And um, I'm cancer free today. I want to leave you with that. Um, God has answered our prayers and the surgery has removed the cancer. I still have some more treatment to go through, but my doctor says that I'm cancer free. And so this is very good news for me and for my family. And honestly, however it ends, whatever happens, I am fully, fully committed to using everything that happens to me and in my life for the Lord's honor and glory. And um, I give Him praise and I thank my brothers and sisters at Gideon Rescue. That is such a powerful story. I mean, literally this summarizes the entire gospel message into this very concise, even in the face of tragedy, you're wanting to bless someone else. You're thinking of somebody else. 
I mean, Stacy's story was so inspiring to me. I remember when you shared this video with me, I just sat in my driveway and just tears were streaming down my face. And I was just thinking like, if I was going to die, if I thought I was going to die, Lord, let me go out like this. Like, let me, let me, let me liter literally come onto the surgery table and say, eh, can I pray with you? Is there something I can pray with you about? Like, like what a beautiful story. And I'm so glad that, that you shared this video with me. It gave me a lot of inspiration and a lot of hope. And uh, yeah, what an impactful story. Yeah, it, it's, it really is amazing. Um, and I, I think it really does show like what happens when, when the full gospel takes a hold of someone because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. You know, like in the, in the midst of the greatest tragedy, I mean, his own creation is all against him, nailing him to a cross. And his thoughts on his mind is not his agony. It's not his, it's not his tragedy. He's not thinking about like, oh, it's so horrible. I'm, I'm so victimized here and so shamed and nobody cares. Nobody's standing for my disciples have all fled and left me. His, his only thought on Lord, his don't mind count it against them. is, don't count it against them. yeah, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Or, or when he's thinking about his mother, John, yeah. John, yeah, I yeah. Just he's in agony behold, and he's thinking, he's thinking of his this mother's is, agony. This, mother's this is your mother, John. Like, take care of her, right? You know, like, I mean, like, this is like it shows you the man, heart of God. You know, it shows you the heart of it, God. Yeah, it, it, and and when the when the thief turns to him and just says, you know, Lord, remember me. You know, I mean that Jesus is. I mean, yeah. it must that's what must have thrilled his heart because he was like, it's worth it. Like all this pain, all this suffering, all the tragedy. If it's just for one, you, you, it's worth it. You bring up a really good point. When people see that you are literally there for not your own comfort, not your own kingdom, not your own whatever you think you want in life, but you're there for someone else and willing to put yourself in danger, how can you not respond to that? How can you not be like this? This ver this shows you the very heart of God. That's what the heart of God is. I will put myself at risk to come and save you. Yeah, and that's and that's why the centurion, right? Like this guy who's totally pagan, right? He's been raised in pagan religion, pagan philosophy. He's never seen the truth, except for on that day in the in the darkest hour, the darkest hour. The centurion looks at Jesus and he says, "Surely." This was the son of God. He sees that kind of love. No human being can have that kind of love pouring out of them unless they are literally connected to the divine. I mean, that, that's, that's what the secular mindset would say that. That is ludicrous for anyone in this um, dog eat dog and, and you know, survival of the fittest world that, that the devil has duped everybody to believe that that's what living is, right? I got to get mine before you got to get yours. And this is flipping that narrative on its head. And Stacy's story is a real practical example of that. And I just, I was hugely impacted by that story. And that was a beautiful, 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 well-edited video. And so I really, Brock, look forward to seeing your documentary because you guys, this guy has flown into disasters when turkeys bombed out and 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 it, like literally leveled to the ground. They're flying in there with Black Hawk helicopters. The government is dropping them off because God literally opened those doors. And so it just seems like story after story after story of this. I, I have to go on one of these trips, Brock. Like <laughs> I'm literally like ready to go, but um, I'm really praying for your ministry, Gideon Rescue. Um, I hope that you guys have far and wide um, success in winning many souls to the kingdom. And I'm sure only in heaven will we actually see what, what kind of work you, you your, your ministry has been able to do. And uh, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I'm very honored to be connected to this young man right here. Brock is my little brother. Brother, and uh, I just absolutely love this kid to death. He inspires me like to no end. And it's beautiful to be in ministry, have Brock be in ministry. Uh, I got another brother, Tom, in ministry. And um, man, that's what it's about. You guys get involved. Like this is literally the end of the world. And if you don't have some active involvement in a ministry, if you are not 
there. Pray for people in ministries. That's an active ministry right there. If you have financial means, help fund some of these ministries. Get involved. Get to know a ministry. Uh, link up with them. Donate to them. Uh, this is part of ministry. And actually, that is as much actively involved in the ministry as Brock going out there and, and handing those God pods out. Those things are expensive. And it's beautiful that uh, Adventist World Radio, Radio that donated those. I mean, he, they've donated pallets of these things to them and they're expensive. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ministries that you guys can get involved in to help finish this work and get the gospel out before there is no time. And so I hope that you guys were very blessed by today's show. Um, please look Gideon Rescue up if you are young or old or whatever, and you want to get involved. I mean, these guys have a wide range of people that donate time to them and, and go on the rescue missions with them. And so start connecting with them on Facebook, start connecting with them on YouTube or, or you know, call him up. You can get his phone number and uh, go and do some of these awesome trainings that they have. And uh, we know that things in the world are not going to necessarily get better. In fact, the Bible tells us it's going to get much worse. So while we have the ability, while we have the energy, now is the time. And that's why we want to share this message with you. So we hope you guys were super blessed by today. Um, thank you, Brock, for being on board and uh, coming and sharing us with uh, what Gideon Rescue is up to. And uh, we will clearly be checking in with you later down the road as uh, things kind of develop in your ministry. But um, we, we hope you guys were super blessed and uh, please subscribe, like, share this video. You know, um, it really helps us push these, these ideas out and you guys are, are able to help us. And that's even a small ministry, just, just liking and sharing the video or subscribing to it. That in itself is helping the content get out to more people. So please, if you haven't done that before, smash that subscribe button and uh, we will definitely want to keep this ministry in our prayers and uh, keep our ministry in your prayers as well. May God bless you and we'll see you next time on LED Live. If you're looking for good, wholesome, educational content for your children, subscribe to our new channel, Little Light Kids. If you're looking for a way to spruce up your wardrobe this year, check out Lightwear.shop. It's a Christian-owned apparel company with the belief that we are all walking billboards. One of the best ways to share your witness is to wear your witness. These conversation starter designs are the perfect way to look good while shining your light for Christ. For a limited time, use promo code LOVE for 15% off your entire order. That's 15% off for new clothing for you and maybe a gift for someone special. So go to Lightwear.shop and remember use promo code LOVE.